Signon on Zoom. Um, you know, and it's always uh, it's kind of remind me of how why I'm always jealous of Jorn and his kitchen and and his lunch that he makes during all of our calls. Um, so first of all, I would like to welcome everyone um, to the first in the series of our second edition of the CCCM Tuesdays. Um, uh, my name is Juan Sopan Panic, in case um, we don't know each other. Um, I work as um, a co-lead uh, a co-lead uh, for the global CCCM cluster from IOM side. And I think at the start, I would also like to invite you to also introduce yourself um, in the chat. It would be great if you can tell us your name, but also um, where you're currently working. Um, just so we can have an idea on the geographical spread of, of our participants for today. Um, as I said, it's like it's also um, to launch the series of CCCM Tuesdays, which I think is always special. Um, I mean, not just that it brings a lot of our practitioners together, but I think it's also the fact that we just took all the challenges and the frustrations of this past year and we say like, we're just gonna turn this into the opportunities and take this time to kind of like build and strengthen up our community of practice. And, and I feel like, you know, we're better off for it. And hopefully one day we'll be able to be at a point where we can look back and, and appreciate um, what we're achieving here at this moment. The, um, the working group chairs have together decided to use the image of Uhuru Peak on Kilimanjaro as a symbol of this series. It's, you know, to represent our quest towards um, a community of practice that harbor and promotes um, like persistence and excellence work in camp management. And personally, I also think that if you have to walk up a mountain, you know, it's better to do it with your friends, with people you trust, and especially better to do it with someone who've done it before. So I think we're very, very lucky that we have so many of these mountain guides who are willing to contribute and put in their times and efforts um, towards like this stronger community of practice. Um, and it's always so great to start off these discussions with the minimum standards for camp management, because I feel like we spend the last three years um, working and developing and talking to so many of you and putting together um, what is now currently like the final draft for field testing of, of the standards. So thank you very much to um, Jennifer and Tom for being the first one. It's always um, where we iron out all about technical glitches and any snacks that we might come across while we um, settle into this pace of online webinars again. Um, just before closing, I'm also just going to mention that we'll be doing this every last Tuesdays of every month. Um, the next one is gonna be on capacity development in March. And then in April, we're gonna be talking about area-based approach. And then we have also line up the discussion around sustainable solutions for May and then discussions on participation in June. We'll also be talking about localization in September as well. So I think there's a lot to look forward to. And, and I think we'll, we also very much look forward to your engagement as well during this time. So with that, I'm going to hand back over to you, Jen and Tom. Um, Thank you, Juan. Um, I like the idea of climbing together with friends. That actually is one of my favorite pastimes is, is climbing mountains with friends. And so, yeah, um, and that's really what we wanted to do um, with this session today is really just um, talk in a really down to earth way and, and use the standards ourselves. So um, Tom and I tapped kind of all of the expertise within the, not all of the expertise, some of the expertise within the working group and kind of mostly Tom's right now. So um, it's nice to see everyone introducing themselves on, on the chat and I'll ask you to continue to do that because then that helps us know kind of who are the new people involved and maybe what are the new ideas and new people to be engaged in the topic. And I'm going to start off with a mentee because I recognize some people, but I don't recognize everyone. 
and switch over and just frame our discussion a little bit more today um, to be able to manage what we're going to do in the session itself and how um, you can engage in the topic of using the minimum standards yourselves. So Mario, I'm going to switch over and start sharing my mentee. It's asking me if I want to continue, and I do. So I hope everybody has a phone close. And if not, then those of you that do, please use it. And remember, you're going to need to go to menti.com and you're going to enter the code for, no, not for, 79401510. That's menti.com, 79401510. And I see a lot of people are already starting to play the menti. And the question, the first question is really how familiar are you with the development of the minimum standards on camp management? And we're asking that question because we will go into more depth if we get a lot of people in this novice category and this moderate category. I see a lot of experts on it. So that's great. We're gonna be experts talking to each other. Um, but if you wanna think about um, a particular question you may have about using the minimum standards, uh, it looks like a lot of people are very familiar with Menti and very familiar with the revision process that we went through to get our minimum standards. If you're putting in um, kind of moderately familiar or the one person who's been brave to say that they're a novice, it's their first time hearing about them, bravo. Um, I'm gonna ask Mario to put in the chat the link back to the sessions that we've done in the um, during the retreat in which we kind of launched the standards. And so there's um, more research that you can do. All right, so we have a, a moderate group to my fellow panelists. Um, and I'm glad that the moderates have outweighed the experts at this point, but that's good. Uh, the next question that we want to ask you. And again, these are kind of our framing questions so that we now have much in depth to go into. Is um, a little bit about just to elaborate a little bit about the, the standards themselves. And I hope you can see the standards on your screens right now. And when you think about the minimum standards, I want to point out two really important parts. And the first part is these green boxes at the top. And those are the humanitarian charter, the protection principles, and the core humanitarian standards. And the minimum standards for camp management are completely aligned with the way in which the other humanitarian standards like SPEAR, like INEE, which is the Educations and Emergencies Handbook, like the Child Protection Standbook, Child Protect, Child Protection Handbook. Um, they have been aligned with the same types of principles, rights-based principles that the other humanitarian standards that you are more familiar with have been written on. So when we talk about the minimum standards for camp management, we're talking about humanitarian situations. We're talking about organizations that are aligning themselves with that fundamental part of what is essential for humanitarian action to take place in an ethical and humane way. So those, that's the foundation and the framework for them. And then I wanna point out the five different domains and those five different domains, the policies and capacities, community participation and representation, the site environment, the way it's kept, the service coordination and monitoring that we do of other partners and the site closure and exit planning are the five key areas that we feel that camp managers should be responsible for in every humanitarian context. The five domains follow the same formula that SPHERE does, outlining a large standard and then following it with key actions or steps that can be taken as well as guidance notes and indicators. The guidance notes are where we really get into the, 
degrees of differences based on typology or management type. So that's just a little brief of an overview about how they're organized. And now we're going to go up back to the next question because there's a probability that you may not know about how the minimum standards in camp management were developed. And we want to just make sure that you have a clear idea of what were the methodologies that were used to develop the minimum standards. So if you can go back to your mentee and vote, you can choose as many as you think might be relevant. And we're bringing this up mostly because we want to make sure that people have a good sense of how broadly they were consulted, um, the participation that was involved, how wide the consultation was. So good, I see answers coming in. Um, and again, reflecting our expertise on the call, most people are familiar with the fact that the working group played a large role in both developing methodologies and then reviewing all the different consultations that took place. Most people seem to be less familiar with the fact uh, the role that the editor played. Um, I will let you keep voting, but then kind of talk over the interaction here and let you know that all of these methods were used. And each of the persons probably on this call played some role in their development. And the um, the important part about the editor is that she really looked at all the different consultations that had taken place, both online and in person, and to make sure that um, we were reflecting both the expert advice that we got internally from the CCM colleagues and experts that were consulted in the field and online, as well as the comments from the the thematic experts coming from humanitarian standards partners as well as um, those that were coming online through PHAP with the broader humanitarian community. So all these methodologies were used. Um, the next question that I have you to have, uh, would like you to ask is around this word standards. And I'm wanting you to vote true or false about your understanding of what standards are. So I'm gonna read out to you, standards are general universal statements that can be related to any disaster situation, both conflict or natural disaster, and that they're based on the right to life with dignity. We tend to use this word and you're gonna, I think if we were playing a game where you would have to click on um, how many times you hear the word standards that it would be kind of exponential, we would be able to, make a lot of money on it, but um, good. I see lots of people answering true. Even if you were brave enough to push false, I want you to, <laughs> to, um, to recognize that we're gonna use the word standards a lot of different ways in this discussion, that sometimes we may um, say standards when we mean something different, which are indicators. And indicators and standards vocabulary in English can get confusing. But I want you to think now and to just our last mentee question is really like, if we know that indicators are signals to show if a standard has been reached, which type of indicators are used in our CCCM handbook? Are they process indicators? Are they progress indicators or are they monitoring indicators? So what type of indicators are used? So target indicators, progress indicators or process indicators. See lots of people voting here, that's good. Um, this is, Again, a little bit of a trick question. And the answer is all three. And all three types of these indicators are used really because you need all three types when you are considering what are you trying to achieve. So again, 
we want you to be really familiar with the minimum standards. We want you to be able to, minimum standards meaning the handbook. We want you to be able to use them and to think about how they can be useful for your context. Um, and all three are used, and this is exactly the way that they're used in Sphere too. So I'm going to stop the Menti now. Thank you for, for giving me your feedback and for showing your familiarity with the topic. Mario, if I can ask you to throw up the agenda on the screen. Let me just tell you um, the way in which the session is going to be run and, and how we're going to go into this topic this morning or this afternoon. Um, I was looking at my calendar and it has a big picture of a lemon on it for February. And so I was thinking about how um, sometimes in camp management, maybe particularly in uh, project development, when you're going out and having to respond to an emergency, or yes, one, we're gonna make lemonade. Um, or when you're a cluster coordinator and you're feeling kind of stuck or when you're doing capacity building, um, that sometimes you get kind of, you feel like you get a whole basket of lemons and you can't really eat anything that's being given to you. So our session today is to really think about how you can engage with minimum standards in the handbook to be able to address the issues that you may be seeing today. So, um, I seen in your work. So I would like to first introduce um, my co-chair for the working group, Mr. Tom Stork. And um, Tom is currently in Sudan. He's part of the impact team for the Danish Refugee Council. And Tom, we're gonna start off by having you share with us how you use the minimum standards in project development. And if you can, um, maybe just start off by telling us a little bit about what uh, when you went there, what the situation is, and you can have Mario advance the slides for you as our most useful, and we have some questions as you go along. So, Tom, over to you. Okay, yes. Uh, I, I, I deployed to Sudan in, in December of last year um, as part of the DRC emergency team. We, for, for those who have followed the, the crisis in the Tigray region of Ethiopia, there is displacement of around 50,000 individuals into Sudan, almost all of which um, are now in two refugee camps and a number still in uh, transit or reception sites on the border. Uh, DRC is, part, is, is going through the, the, the many difficult stages of, of establishing an office, right? So buying furniture, recruiting staff, setting up our initial activities. And um, certainly one of the, 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 the painful parts of that is, is fundraising. I don't think anyone uh, likes writing grants, um, especially grants in an emergency setting where we know that things will um, change. We have a, a rainy season that is fast approaching. We have... Um, a, 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 you know, a, a very large scale up of a humanitarian response. So it can be very difficult um, in, in, in terms of expressing what we want to do. Um, here in Sudan, we want to certainly undertake what we see as a site management support role. So very similar to Greece, to Iraq, to and, and certainly Bangladesh, where um, we where, where where we support the UNHCR and government-led response, particularly in, in, in site management uh, support. So um, yes, certainly, how do we use the minimum standards? Um, as I think I've made clear, writing grants is difficult, um, especially when we have situations where every donor has a different template, every donor has a different approach, um, and every donor has an, often a different preference as to what they want to see. So firstly, in terms of uh, our operational setup and the operational setup of the camps, we look towards the standards as, as being a, as, as, as a baseline, right? As standards often are. So I look at, um, I, I, I picked out two standards, which which I think helped us in in, in, in our understanding, which is 
firstly around governance structures. So inclusive and representative governance structures are accountable and have the capacity to meet the needs of the site population. And certainly what we saw in Sudan is um, attempts were being made towards some form of governance or community structure. But with the standard, we could much better explain, well, yes, there is a structure there, but it needs to improve. It needs to improve, not just because I think it needs to improve, but because if it was measured against that standard, it, 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 it wouldn't reach it. Um, and secondly, around site management teams having the operational and technical capacity to manage the the site i mean a lot of what um a, a lot of the fundraising that we look towards for site management much of it is not it, 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 it may be commonly accepted program costs right we're not buying a lot of material we're not buying tarpaulin we're not buying nfi kits but we're creating quite a large team um training them and also training our government counterparts and that comes at, at, at a cost um, and so uh, I mean these are just two examples but the the minimum standard has, has, has helped us in 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 defining very much what we want to do and I I, I think one of the I, I mean we've all faced um, the same challenge which is, trying to explain to someone who isn't involved in camp management, what do camp managers do? And previously, um, as I'm sure everyone else has, because I definitely do it, you start writing the grant and you open the CCCM toolkit, right? Um, and you read through it, kind of feel like, yes, I, I pretty much remember this. Um, what can we take out? Um, and um and 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 use it in, in in the grant whereas now with the minimum standards it's much easier uh to highlight our, our activities highlight where they are aided towards minimum standards um and, and and much better explain what camp management is because too often it's seen as a luxury or or some of the activities are seen as aspirational Whereas when we rephrase them around um, activities are designed for us to reach a minimum standard, minimum standards that we are certainly failing in Sudan, it becomes um, a much more coherent, much more uh, formal approach to, to, to project development. Does that help? <laughs> Um, that, that helps a lot. That gives us a framing for like what you've been doing, which is, um, I mean, I guess I know from our Skype chats that you've been organizing distributions and setting up the office and um, trying to, to get DRC's programs um, launched. But maybe you could be a bit more concrete. I, asked, I, I see here that um, Khalid has asked you for some more examples. And you mentioned governance. So oh. how did you, you opened up the camp management minimum standards and thought, oh, I need to put in something about camp governance or was your process a little bit different? Maybe start us back with receiving people or putting together your, your grant process. And why did you choose Camp governance is one of your your key activities. Yeah, so I I, I think if, if we take a step back all all the way to the start, is that even before fundraising in Sudan, um, as is, as is very or is increasingly common, um, the government take a very active role here. Um, and UNIT, Shia, um, and CAR, the Commission of Refugees, are very clear that they have. Um, the leadership, the management, the coordination of those camps. Um, and so coming back to kind of one of the points is, is well, what, what does site management support do? The standards was helpful in us demonstrating that um, uh, although activities were being, were being led by CAR, that there was improvement to be made and that improvement could be measured against those standards. Um, in terms of of how we approach the, um, or in terms of how we approach our own strategy building. When we 
visit the camps um, and when we have started these very small initial activities um, we have a small protection team we have a site planner here we have um, a small amount of items to distribute it very quickly became apparent that there are many gaps and so there are many gaps in services there's gaps in coordination and um, sometimes i mean certainly especially in a in an emerging crisis in a brand new camp it can seem um i mean very overwhelming the volume of need uh the number of activities that need to be done and so governance is certainly one example um but when we and and, and i'm sure many camp managers feel the same way the, the the volume of tasks and activities that fall under camp management um, and the diversity of those tasks is huge. So how can we tie together, let's say, care and maintenance with governance, um, with camp environment, with camp coordination? Um, and, and, and I think certainly it just becomes this overwhelming number of um, very small, often, tasks that need tying together. And I think the standards helps in tying that um, into something that's coherent. Obviously, coherence not often been my my strong point. <laughs> That's not true. Um, I I like the way that you said that they're kind of interconnected, and that you need to to you know look at governance and how it impacts care and maintenance, for example, or how it impacts your staff structure. I'm wondering how um, in Sudan. I know it it can be um, quite and 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 Ethiopia. Your uh, the situation there is that you're welcoming in um, not. Uh, Sudanese internally displaced, but actually Ethiopian refugees. So it's it's kind of a conservative culture. How have the standards helped you to analyze uh, maybe the gender roles, which may be slightly differently articulated than what you would see from a, a camp management structure at its ideal form, which would have maybe equal representation between men and women? Have you used any of the the key actions to help you rethink your team structure or how you might go about getting to an equal representation of men and women in your governance structures? Yeah, this is quite, uh, I, I, I certainly can talk around an example on this. Um, I mean, we're still very much in the, in the early days around governance. Uh, but one of the first things that we found when we visited the camps is that um, a governance system had been put in place um, by CAR, um, which was an entirely male um, block leadership, very similar to Majes in, in, in Bangladesh, where discrete uh, portions of the camp have a male representative who is there to, um, to, to then facilitate distributions, to work as a focal point, to help communicate messages. Um, and so, um, I mean, to some people, then governance, that, that box has been ticked. Uh, it's in place, right? I mean, you, there, there is a governance structure. Uh, and, and pushing back on that and saying, well, actually, no, for governance is far more complex than that, requires representation from far more groups, there was no transparency maybe in that process, there's obviously no being, there is not only, there, there is not the inclusion of any females, but also males from marginal groups, whether they be uh, youth, whether they be elderly, whether they be disabled. I mean, and, and so one of, certainly one of the ways in which the minimum standards has helped is in uh, better articulating what we are looking to achieve in particular around governance, right? And, and, and I know I don't have the standards open, uh, so don't ask me to quote from it, but, um, but certainly that section on governance very, very clearly breaks it down. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's much easier for us then to say, well, this is actually what we want to achieve. And I know in, 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 some of the, in some of the discussions that we have had uh, at the CC, you know, in some of the previous events, one of the things that comes up, I think, is that the toolkit is very good and certainly is, right? We use it a lot. Um, it's a very key document. 
but I think is sometimes seen as, especially in emergencies, as aspirational. It as we'll get to that next month when things calm down. Whereas I think the minimum standards has been useful in 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 defining, uh, you, you know, very much defining what is, as its title suggests, the minimum standard, um, which is certainly failing here. I I do have the. Um minimum standards open so we can be a tag team on this and one of the indicators that could be useful is the percentage of female committee members who feel that their views are taken into account during decision making for example yeah. or um, the interagency coordination meetings again connecting them back to each other where the community um, representatives are involved in those meetings so I think that you already have some of those, I mean, Halid, to come back to your, um, your question. So some of those examples could be inspirational for you to make sure that the, um, the role that DRC is playing in both educating core and working as an SMS agency can have those benchmarks. Yeah, absolutely. So your first example, right? The um the percentage of, of uh, uh, around those feeling listened to and on gender. I mean, it's currently zero. Um, <laughs> so I mean, that I mean, there's there's kind of sufficient challenge there. Um, and, and I mean, looking through the standards, uh, we are currently both camps currently. I mean, I know they've only been in existence for a few months, but we are there is a, a lot of work to do. I mean. That's one example that is at zero, and I'm sure that there are many more. Um, and certainly now, as we move out of this fundraising cycle and our, our initial emergency activities, the next stage is launching activities that we will run for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and again, that's where the minimum standards uh, comes in, right? The idea of, well, firstly, we need to measure them. I mean, we then need to design enough activities that where we can sufficiently show that we're raising them. Um, but no, I think your, your, your first example uh, is very personal because it's at the moment it is zero. And without, um, without someone highlighting that it is zero and that that is a problem, um, it would very much go unquestioned because on, if you look at governance just as a box ticking exercise, that box has been ticked there is leadership in place. Um, but in terms of measuring that against the standard, it, 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 it's, it's very much failing. Well, I mean, I'm not trying to say that DRC's programming is bad in, in Sudan. On the contrary, I think the awareness that there are target, I mean, it goes back to that, what I was saying in the beginning about the framing, you know, that, that mm. the indicators are there to let you know if you're reaching the target or not. The indicators are there to let you know um, how much progress you've made against that. So you're saying right now at the start of operations that that particular indicator is, is low, but that doesn't mean that you can't use that to set a target that's gonna be higher and to, to put in place key actions that would get you women's committees, just for example. Yeah, absolutely. And I, 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 well, I wasn't thinking that you were having a go at DRC programming, but now I am. Uh, <laughs> is, is no, I mean, the standards very much highlight uh, the huge challenge that is ahead of us over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, considering that the rain will start in two. Um, uh, but I think, and, and it kind of comes back to, to, um, to one of the points I made earlier is that, um, so, I mean, clearly there is an issue with governance in the camps. There is also an issue with desludging the latrines. There's also an issue with land allocation. There's also, a, you know, there are so many and often does feel quite overwhelming number of um, very challenging issues that we face and, and, and cutting them down into manageable activities, into manageable tasks or into manageable advocacy messaging um is 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 key and, and 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 that is certainly where i've seen the minimum standards play that role in 
you know, it's 10 o'clock at night, you kind of want to finish your day's work, but you know that we have to address the many issues that we're facing, having the standards uh, and, and, and to be able to, to kind of cut through um, the, that kind of, that just sheer number of, 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 of issues at the coordination meetings, there are a huge number of things coming up. Um, and yes, trying to add, I mean, trying to provide um, structure in chaos, right? Which is, which is obviously very difficult. Um, maybe maybe one, one more question to you. And that was something that we talked about when we were preparing for this was the role that you felt that having the minimum standards play between you and your headquarters. And just as a final reflection, uh, did you use the minimum standards to communicate to the headquarters in Copenhagen? And if so, how, and was that, what was that process like? Yeah, I, I, I think not only to headquarters in, in um, Copenhagen, but also Khartoum, right? Um, in Sudan, um, TRC hasn't been involved in site management support before. Um, and so there is a uh, senior management that, I mean, that in many ways require a, a form of convincing um, or at least a form of um, reassurance that they haven't just deployed Tom Stark and he's now just making everything up as he goes along, which I sometimes I think a feeling people get. Um, and, and, and so being able to call back to a, to a, to, to, to a recognized document that DRC itself has, has um, endorsed um, that very much aligns with what I am suggesting that we do is super helpful because sometimes um, it, 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 it can seem like we're plucking things out of, out of thin air and being able to call it back to, to a document, certainly at Cartoon, certainly in contexts where we where traditionally maybe there hasn't been site management support or camp management, um, it is very helpful to be able to call back to that document. Um, so yes, I mean, uh, kind of being able to back up um, what uh, what I'm proposing to do, um, the standards have certainly helped. And again, and I'm not just having a go at the toolkit, but the toolkit. Um, can sometimes seem very aspirational or that we get the comment, well, that won't work here. Um, the example in the toolkit, well, that won't work. Uh, we have to do it differently. Whereas maybe the more, um, the more kind of um, contextless um, standards um, that are written in a way that can be applied regardless very much of context, make it much easier to, to kind of convince um, not only Khartoum, Copenhagen, but also even donors who may be reticent about uh, supporting site management. That's really useful. And, and I, I like the way that you've um, kind of taken us to the fact that actually in the index of the field testing of it, field testing version, which Brian has just shared in the chat, um, does have an index back and forth between the toolkit. And I think they need to be seen as complementary, and that's useful. Um, I don't want to cut, cut our conversation short, and maybe we have a chance to kind of come back to you in a little bit, but we do want to kind of shift profiles away from emergency people who are deploying into um, new crisis situations and move into kind of the, the other part of our um, roles and responsibilities, and that's into the the cluster coordinators. And I want to um, introduce Elisa who is also a core member of the working group. And, um, ooh, nice picture. Uh, Elisa, are you gonna show us yourself on screen also? I'm not just... already showing myself. So. Okay, there you are, hi. Um, so I, let me introduce you properly. I mean, even though we're all friends here on, on, the, on the call, um, Elisa, you work as an information manager and you're part of the global support team for UNHCR and you're one of the founding members of the working group on minimum standards and so 
Um, when, when we started developing the minimum standards, um, you've been kind of the voice of reason saying about these indicators. Let's make sure that people really understand how to use the indicators. And so your next uh, 15 minutes is really taking us through how to use the indicators and how not to use the indicators. So a kind of do's and don'ts around indicator usage. And again, going back to our idea of sometimes when you have lemons, you need to know how to make them into lemonade. So um, great, if you can um, take us through your presentation and when you wanna advance the slides, just let us know. Okay, sure. Um, I guess you can change the slide and Jen, thanks for the introduction. I guess that was a bit of stretch about the founding members. I joined the team a year and a half ago, but I did have used the toolkit before and came up to some similar conclusions to what the standards look like now at the moment. So um, to start with, I could see that there are some coordinators on the call and some non-coordinators at the call. So we'll start with a bit of a introduction to the cluster system. So a cluster system, as some of you might know, basically engages on various levels. You have the interagency engagement, you have the organization specific engagement, and you have the cluster sector part. And now the cluster sector part is um, usually responsible of um, strengthening the humanitarian response in terms of um, trying to prioritize the needs um, also being accountable and providing guidance to the organizations that are working under that cluster. And there is an HPC cycle that many of you might be familiar with that starts with needs assessment um, that leads into HNOs, humanitarian needs overviews, <clears throat> strategic planning, resource mobilization, implementation and monitoring, and operational peer review and evaluation. And basically, um, the standards, as Tom has been saying, and the perfect introduction from Jen, were primarily targeting <clears throat> the site managers. So the question that we were asking ourselves at some point, how to inject the minimum standards within the cluster system. And there is some pros and cons and some kind of cautiousness on how to use it and how to understand those indicators and standards. And we can go through them now. Jen, if you can change the slide, please. Okay, thank you. And um, basically, um, let's start with the simple one with humanitarian needs overview. So how to use the standards in the humanitarian needs overview. Some of you might know that humanitarian needs overview is based on two types of analysis. The first one, is your sector specific analysis. It's basically we as a cluster, a CCM cluster, we try to identify our people in need and we also try to identify our severity in terms of which sites, camps, uh, population groups are we gonna be prioritizing and coordinating the response in. And then the second part is the intersectorial analysis. And that one involves all other clusters, and it's basically a joint um, analysis of different cluster indicators into one and basically giving an overview of a country. So can we use the, um, the minimum standards indicators? Um, yes, we can. Uh, you would usually can use them to model our monitoring and basically the quality of response of our camp management actors. And why I say quality of response, it's because um, a lot of times um, you will notice in our indicators, there is uh, a line saying percentage of females satisfied, percentage of people satisfied. So it's usually a satisfaction and also because the breakdown of those mini steps, it's basically also in a, some way ensuring the quality of reaching a certain um, standard, basically. Um, we don't really advise using the standards indicator exclusively to measure camp severity. And why do I say so? Because as some of you might know, we're already quite an intersectoral cluster. CCCM cluster involves not only camp management, but also coordinating on the site different actors. 
And therefore, we do need to go back and ask them to consult them in terms of indicators, thresholds, and validation of the data that we collect um, to identify the camp needs. Uh, in addition, for the intersectoral analysis, which I said, as I said, there's two components in HNO. Um, we already have an HNO indicator registry, and that indicator registry, me and my counterpart, Brian, have worked hard to put together a few indicators in um, that are somehow speaking and derived from the standards, but not specifically in the same wording. Um, what I would keep in mind while I'm using the indicators for HNO is basically that um, the minimum standards are intended for different data collection methods. You will notice that some indicators are more applicable for focus group discussions, some of them are on household level, some of them are key informant, and between the interviewees groups. So some of them, of the questions could be asked directly to a site manager, some of them has to go back and be asked to the IDPs living on the site or in camp. And therefore that kind of changes and shifts. So you cannot just take that indicator, inject it somewhere without understanding how you can use it. The next step after we identify our population in need and our prioritization, um, we move into HRPs. And HRPs are basically humanitarian response uh, programming where we, after we have identified the prioritization, um, basically set up our objectives of the cluster, our indicator for that objective, and um, also other sub indicators or activities you can call them uh, to monitor the response for that whole year for the needs and priorities that we have identified earlier. Now, can we use in the HRPs um, the standards? Yes, because we can guide the organization submitting their project proposals in terms of what type of activities they need to ensure to have, and also to raise the quality of uh, performance of those agencies year by year. As Tom was explaining earlier, um, some things are cannot be put immediately into uh, to be launched. So you need time to build up the capacity. You need time to build up some sub steps that are used in the standards. So maybe year by year you can basically improve on that and include those sub activities. Um, what you shouldn't be using the standards for, though, is you shouldn't be using the standards indicators to set up your core HRP objectives. Um, because the core HRP objective is uh, quite encompassing, it sounds sometimes more as a standard itself, as basically uh, providing a dignified um, setup for the IDPs. Um, and we will go through it in a bit now. Um, what should we keep in mind is basically that our strategic advisory groups are being consulted as a cluster in terms of setting up our objective indicators and sub activities and to make sure that whatever we put together uh, will have targets and could be measured. Um, so something that we know we will be collecting data on. So basically using a focus group discussion indicator knowing that we won't be conducting focus group discussions, or it could be quite problematic to get focus group discussions performed by all agencies in the country, then maybe we should um, change it or simplify it. So simplification is one of the ways of going through forward too. The next step is basically implementation and monitoring. So we have set up our, we found out our needs, we selected our people in need, we set up our strategic planning, people applied for projects, they got their funding, now they're implementing. Um, what do we do with implementation? Well, we can use the standards to gather information and identify red flags. So basically um, seeing that um, an organization um, has not set up a governance structure, for example, 
uh, three months consequently, basically, we can raise a flag and ask as a cluster, why is it so? Do you need any guidelines from us? Um, however, we should be quite careful because as a cluster, um, we cannot be radically evaluating organizational performance all the time. Um, it, kind, kind, it could be a bit tricky. Um, though we should be encouraging and providing guidance and to improve our the support. Um, also, as I said before, keeping in mind that the operational context might be different. Um, it could be different population, um, logistical realities, baseline, etc. So it will depend quite heavily on the context. Um, Jen, if you can put the next slide, please. I just want to point out that that is something that's noted very much in the minimum standards document on page five, that, that the degree to which you can use the standards for monitoring really does depend quite a bit, but it does provide you with that common um, framework for setting goals. So. Yeah, thank you. So basically, um, a practical example on uh, that I'm showing here is uh, from one country X. Um, and it shows to you that a cluster, a CCM cluster, has set up an objective saying facilitate and coordinate the provision of dignified living conditions, including access to essential service uh, meeting minimum standards for IDPs living in camps and informal sites. Now, yeah, thank you for pointing out. And as you can see, the objective is quite general. Um, how do you monitor it as a cluster? You basically would want to know how many people live in camps usually. That's the simplest monitoring that you can have as an indicator. So the indicator that will go into it is gonna be number of IDPs living in formal camps and in formal sites. Um, the next one is gonna be the CCCM sub activities. And this is what they call the standards could be injected into quite well. And it's basically explaining what type of activities the organization should do in order to reach um, and coordinate the provision of dignified living conditions for IDPs. Um, and it could be um, different types. For example, it could be multi-sectoral assessments conducted to identify the needs. Um, it could be uh, coordinating the response, um, service mapping, basically that's referrals, to other humanitarian partners, et cetera. Those sub-activities could be further divided. Now, to monitor them could be a tricky thing. And why I'm saying it could be a tricky thing because um, for a cluster, sometimes it's easier to simplify things. Um, for example, on governance structures, um, uh, one of the indicators, if I'm and I quote it correctly in the standard says percentage of population had a, um, having opportunity to influence the site management coordination. Um, percentage of population by itself is basically means how many people are participating. You might need to do a household level interviews or focus group discussions. Doing that on a monthly basis might be a problematic thing. So what uh, one of the clusters did um, they basically asking, um, did community leaders participate in your meetings with the camp managers? Yes or no. Now, it could be divided how many females have been included, um, <clears throat> how many leaders have been, how they were selected. So there is a lot of further questions to be asked. Uh, but as a baseline, as a trigger, as a red flag for the cluster to monitor that we are adhering to some standard, a simplified version could be used. And I hope that makes a bit of more sense and simplified the manner for you. I think I think he's could have done a good job kind of um, providing uh, some narrowing of the topic from your point of view as an information manager and as working from a cluster support team perspective. Um, I see that Catherine has written in the chat. And um, Catherine, I don't know if you're a, able to unmute, but it might be nice to hear somebody else's voice. So if you want to unmute and maybe just say your question and 
share your experience about how, as a cluster coordinator, you were able to use a previous iteration of the draft humanitarian, the draft camp management standard. So, Catherine, are you there? Oh no, of course your internet just cut out. Um, well, we'll see if you can get reconnected. Um, Catherine's saying that in an earlier version in when we were still doing the consultations that she was able to use um, the minimum standards in the development of the HRP project sheets. And I think that that's actually complementary to what you were saying, Elisa, that you were talking about the, oh, there you were. I see your name coming I'm back. I'm back, I'm sorry for that. That's okay, it, it, it caused drama, so that's good. So I, I'll, let you, I'll <laughs> let you speak for yourself, go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Um, no, I was just um, yeah, agreeing with what Alyssa was saying that um, a few years ago, we had a new cluster in Somalia, and so the partners were quite new to camp management in general. Um, so we used an earlier version of the standards to develop our, like, yeah, the sub activities of the HRP. So we had like three overall HRP um, objectives, and then we listed activity wise um, under each of these objectives exactly what we meant by that. And so that partners could use this as a guide to write their HRP sheets. Uh, and then we ended up using that for several, like until this day, we still use it. And for um, the pooled fund proposals, um, because we were constantly having new NGOs joining because we had a lot of national NGOs um, in the cluster and it depended on which areas we were working in, we'd have to recruit new partners quite quickly. Um, and so we use this activity set that was based on the standards for developing proposals with these new NGOs and then um, for continuing the cluster strategy. So we, we used it quite a bit. Um, and then in the newest, um, now that the standards is like finalized and we have all the indicators and everything and other operations I've worked on, we've used this to monitor the partner's progress as a cluster coordinator. Yeah, we use that too, but back in 2018, when I was in Iraq, for example, um, I haven't been familiar with um, standards back then. So what we used was uh, the toolkit, and it was basically narrowing down the camp management toolkit down to something similar to standards to come up with this design of sub-activities. And as Catherine just said, it tremendously helps the partners that are applying and writing their project proposals to guide them what are we looking for. And it also helps the cluster coordinator when they're reviewing the project proposals to see uh, that basically the organizations are going in line to what has been agreed. That kind of simplifies things too on both sides. That's great. So thanks, Elisa, and thanks, Catherine. Um, I really appreciate the fact that we're talking about not being able to just take the lemon and eat the lemon, that we actually have to add some water and add a little bit of sugar and know how we actually need to use the lemon to make our lemonade, just to continue my metaphor. Um, we're gonna switch over and just before taking a quick break, uh, hear another example of how we can, how one program is using the minimum standards in, kind of some strategic planning and capacity building. So Carrie, are you online? Hi everyone. Yes, I am online. I hope you can hear me. I have an unstable internet connection, which is why it shows that I keep leaving and going. So I won't be turning on my camera, but I think that picture is pretty much uh, feast enough for everyone's eyes. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Carrie McBroom. I'm the Site Management Site Development Sector Coordinator in Cox's Bazaar. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about how we plan to use the standards for two kind of strategic objectives for this year. Um, I'll give a really tiny bit of context um, because I think a lot of people know it and then, and then dive right in. I also have to mention that um, Two of the colleagues from Cox's Bazaar, Munir and Ingrid are on the call today and they are much more intimately, intimately familiar with the standards than I am. So I'm, I hope I do them proud uh, representing them as a sector coordinator. Uh, um, but yes, they, they can also feel free to jump in if they wanna add anything. Um, so at the beginning of the response, when there was the huge influx of uh, refugees from Myanmar into Bangladesh, 
you had a lot of um, NGOs who were on the ground, who had the legal permission to work, who had no CCCM experience whatsoever. And coupled with that, you had um, a group of government administrators who were borrowed from other ministries to help support with camp administration. So you really had a context where the people in charge of camp administration and CCCM had very, very little experience. Um, as these relationships were being forged and worked out, there always was kind of this long-term goal that the humanitarian camp management side would eventually be totally handed over to these camp administrators. Now that we're flash forward um, about three and a half years, we have a really solid crew of um, CCCM actors in the camps now um, who haven't fluctuated at least much, much in the last 18 months or so, who kind of have all of the basic boxes ticked in terms of um, most CCCM standards. At the same time, you have a group of government camp administrators who has more um, field experience, more camp management experience, and a large part of that is through not only the on the ground work, but also through the capacity sharing initiative, which is a um, kind of initiative or working group of the site management sector, where we work to develop a core curriculum for the camp in charge support staff, where we work to roll out CCCM TOTs and um, a whole plethora of different capacity sharing and learning experiences that we, uh, we can help, the, help um, to encourage the CICs to become um, stronger camp managers. So in this context, a kind of call for that accelerated handover process uh, has also increased. So this is the context that we're sitting in right now. We have a really strong group of CCCM actors who are well-respected, active in the camps, ready to go to the next level, and we have um, a government camp administration who is eager to take on more responsibility as well. So in that context, we have decided that we want to use the standards um, in two strategic ways. The first is uh, an inward facing way, and that's to hold ourselves accountable. And the second is more of an outward facing way. So when we look at um, the inward facing way, um, basically we want to use them to uh, monitor partners, which I know is something that we just discussed uh, maybe being very delicate on, but this is something that we have decided as a group that at this point in the response, we do wanna have some standard minimum expectations from all partners, um, not to point fingers, but so that we can see where there are gaps and also where there are best practices and where we can improve as a response. And then taking from that baseline and taking from that foundation, having a type of service monitoring uh, of the CCCM standards will also allow us to make sure that we are pinpointing and targeting areas for specific interventions of improvement, but above and beyond that, also kind of strategic um, and creative areas where we as a sector can work on standardized approaches, on pilot projects, and discover areas that we can come together with other sectors on um, to really grow our work into new fields. And the last reason why we want to kind of do this inward facing com um, component of the standards is because we need to be more accountable. Obviously we need to be more accountable to refugees who persistently um, say that their uh, specific priorities, requests for information, questions, feedback are not uh, responded to. And also, um, like Tom was alluding to, it's also really important for donors. We've been really lucky in Cox's Bazaar that we have been uh, well-funded relative to other emergencies. And as we all know, that will shift and change over time. So it's also really important to show donors that we are evolving as a site management response, that we are evolving um, per refugee needs, and that we're also challenging ourselves and pushing ourselves to really show the added value of having camp management there and to give donors an idea, a data-based idea using indicators and using monitoring to show exactly how that evolution is happening. So that's the first part, that's that inward looking part is to monitor partners performance um, across standard, uh, standard indicators, to find places for evolving and improving and to hold ourselves accountable to refugees and donors. 
The other side of this is the outward facing component of how we want to use the standards. And that's really to start framing this handover conversation with the government. Um, and the main component here is that we need the government to agree to a planned principled handover that, uh, that kind of follows minimum expectations and guidelines along the way. And couching this conversation in this sort of neutral global CCCM standards is a really good way, not only to at first advocate for the need for the plan, but also to um, show what kind of benchmarks might be useful along the way in that plan. So if we just pull out two commitments, I can discuss a little bit how these will specifically be used. So for example, if we look at commitment two on participation and representation and the different standards there, which I do have memorized, they are governance, uh, community participation, information sharing and feedback and complaints. As sector coordinator, I can tell you that our partners have done a decent job on community participation information sharing and feedback and complaints. It doesn't mean, of course, that there isn't room for improvement or that there aren't specific things that we can adjust there. Um, but it does mean that at least we have kind of the bare minimum standards in place. When we look at governance for a wide variety of reasons, this is a place where our partners and as a sector, we have really fallen behind on. So what can we do here to use these to hold ourselves more accountable and also to move ourselves uh, forward. So for things like community participation, information sharing, and feedback and complaints, where we have the basics in place, we can develop monitoring tools that will help us to develop specific issues, uh, develop on specific challenges. So for example, on feedback and complaints, we know that a lot of women don't go to the feedback and complaints mechanisms. That's something that we can pull out and work on as a specific component of these. Where it comes to governance, where we have done very work, very little work at all, that's an area where the standards really provide us with a roadmap of how we can start from A to Z in terms of rolling out um, some governance, uh, some improved governance in the camps, starting from mapping power dynamics all the way up to evaluating those governance structures once they're in place. So that's kind of how we could look at commitment to in terms of um, having minimum standards for our partners, identifying gaps, and then also identifying places where we can really evolve and hold ourselves accountable. If we want to look at it's the outward facing part of this, that we're that, you know, talking the government through the handover process, that's where we can look at commitment number five, which is the exit and transition uh, uh, commitment. And we would be really looking at the transition component of that. Um, which really puts an emphasis on planning, involving the host community, and ensuring that there are minimum protections for vulnerable people and minimum standards in place. So even having that as a basis of a conversation with the government will be a huge help. So our next steps to put this in place, and it may shock and surprise you all, but we are slightly behind of where we would like to be on this, but our next steps are really to contextualize, operationalize, and um, engage the government. So for contextualization, we want to have a workshop with all of our partners where we can go through the different commitments and some of the indicators and um, kind of con contextualize those for the Cox Bazaar context. Um, and also then um, with, with priorities on three things. The first would be accountability to refugee priorities. The second would be, like I said, kind of going beyond the basic box checking, which, which our brilliant partners have done for the most part. And then uh, thirdly would be with an eye towards identifying those existing gaps in areas where we can evolve and move forward as an SMS uh, response here. And then once we have this contextualization package, which encompasses these priorities, that's when we can operationalize this and look at having a Kobo tool that would be similar to a service monitoring tool and then um, branching off from there, depending on what the data shows us. And so that's the contextualization and oper oper operationalization. Uh, and then, like I said, lastly is, and uh, woven through both of these is involving the government. Um, it's obviously essential to involve the governments in any handover discussion 
but we need to really start um, involving them from day one so that there's ownership in terms of creating the plan for a handover, being on the same page for what that looks like, what kind of activities might be handed over when. And I know some, some we've talked a little bit about having the guidelines officially endorsed either at the DACA level or at Cox's Bazaar, we're at least starting that conversation um, to really bring them into the fold and into the conversation so they feel some ownership and pride over them as well as they uh, stand poised to take over um, uh, some of the site management activities. So that's kind of how our conversation has evolved here in Cox's and where we're headed next. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has them. Thanks. Terry, I really like the way that you framed that as both uh, an internal accountability as well as an external kind of strategic planning. And I'm going to ask people to write their questions for you in the chat. And I'm just going to pick up on Hamza's question, which was about making sure that the affected people are aware of the minimum standards. I think that's a, a really valid point. Um, we have not launched the standards officially yet, but as camp management and as representatives of people who are displaced, I think that that's a really important part of what we will do in the official launch. And um, Hamza, I would hope that maybe you could join the working group if you've got great ideas for that, because I think that that's an essential part of what we want to do to make sure that it's not just the accountability that we have as humanitarian organizations, that it's actually the, the, the step further. Um, and many people who worked in the CCTM cluster are actually formally displaced themselves. And so I think it's a great opportunity to think about how we could involve um, the affected population in that work that we do. It is time for us to take a really quick break and we're running a little bit beyond um, behind our schedule. So I would invite everybody to turn on their camera and we are going to synchronize our watches and take like a three minute break just to be able to run out and drink a glass of water or stand up. And we're gonna come back and when we come back, we're gonna talk about protection mainstreaming programs and the minimum standards checklist on monitoring disability inclusion. So don't go away. We're just gonna take a really, really quick break and then we'll get a chance to ask more questions and to hear about the disability inclusion monitoring checklist. Turn on your cameras if you can. You can see everybody taking a break. Nice. Wave at your friends. Oh, so nice. Hi, Ingrid. Hi, Claudia. New friends too. Isabel. Oh, nice. Show us where you're working from, everybody. Like show your show your outdoor windows. Let us see real camps and real offices. Travis, hey. You're on your way to Cox Bazaar. Oh, nice. Palm trees. Beautiful. This is a great break. See, it's a good energizer. I'm going to show you guys. Oh, wait. If I, I can turn, uh, my camera's not working. I'll show you snow. Yorn, show snow. Mario, just for coordination and, and Anya's, um, We'll start in two minutes, just so that people have a chance to break the rhythm and hear other voices. Hi everyone from Sudan. I'm in my quarantine room, so nowhere exciting. Hi Hamza, really nice to meet you and nice to see your quarantine room. <laughs> Hi. 
Okay, if Agnes is ready, I don't want anybody to leave and I don't want us to go over time. And um, to the impact question about sustainability, we're gonna to get to that right after Agnes's presentation. So it's a, it's a good question. So um, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Agnes, who is a protection officer for the IOM team in Geneva. And Agnes has worked on protection from a couple different ways as a CCCM protection person and has been assigned the disability inclusion portfolio within IOM's CCCM team. And Agnes, there's a little known annex in the back of the minimum standards that is being used in the field testing version and I, I guess I want to ask you. Um, you say that this comes, that this came about as a request from camp managers, and so I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit of the history of it, and then what it aims to do. And then I think it's also been piloted recently in South Sudan. So, and yes, I'm going to turn over to you, and if you can tell us a little bit about how protection mainstreaming programs have used the minimum standards checklist, and tell us a little bit about that. So. Anya's over to you. Sure, thank you, Jen, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, so uh, yes, I'm going to keep very short because I know we're running a bit uh, over time, but uh, this checklist, actually, uh, the idea came from camp managers a few months ago. We started uh, trying to make more efforts to uh, better mainstream disability inclusion concerns uh, in our programs. Uh, this is in line also with our international commitment. As you know, over the past few years, there have been a lot of development on the disability inclusion side. Uh, the Charter for Inclusion of Persons with Disabilities in uh, Humanitarian Action, the Global Disability Summit in London, the IASC guidelines also for inclusion of persons with disabilities in humanitarian action, the UN Disability Inclusion Strategy, and more. Uh, so we really started to, to, to work at uh, mainstreaming this concern in our CCCM responses. And through consultation with camp managers, then they asked for a checklist to help them monitor whether, whether they were doing it right uh, in the camp, whether they could uh, audit uh, what they were doing and know if what they were doing was right, what they could do more. So we started development, uh, developing this uh, checklist based on the camp management standards. Uh, but before going further, there's something I want to, to clarify. As, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, Jen, today we're talking a lot about standards and there are plenty of different standards that exist. So I don't want that uh, there is a confusion in our mind uh, after what I'm going to say. So could you please uh, show the next slide, please? We worked at developing this checklist based on the standard for uh, GAP managers. I really want to make a clear difference between what we've been working on and the existing humanitarian inclusion standards. Uh, the humanitarian inclusion standards have been developed a few years ago, uh, and I will invite uh, people interested in knowing more about them to go through them. What I want also to, to highlight is that the humanitarian inclusion standards do not include any chapter or any reference to CCCM. So this is why we also worked based on the humanitarian inclusion standards to create something for CCCM uh, people. So um, this is uh, uh, the, the, the background around this checklist. Uh, but again, just to make sure we all got it, this is a checklist to assist camp managers in auditing their own programs for standards. Please uh, go uh, and check the humanitarian inclusion standards. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, this checklist was uh, developed uh, over the, the past months and uh, field tested uh, recently in South Sudan in Wow. Uh, unfortunately, so our colleagues in charge of uh, this uh, field testing couldn't uh, join the 
the call today, but we uh, we managed to, uh, to to catch up and to to have a review of this experience and collect their, their feedback on uh, this tool. Um, next slide, please. So what they uh, highlighted and what they, they said to us was that uh, it was a very uh, positive exercise in a sense that uh, going through the checklist allowed uh, the staff to, to monitor ongoing practices related to inclusion in uh, the camp and give them uh, many more ideas to, to enhance the, the current efforts that were ongoing um, beyond what they were uh, already implementing. Uh, they said that the checklist was uh, providing uh, uh, a lot of guiding questions to, to identify what was being done, what was missing, or what could be improved. Some of the examples that uh, they gave us was that, for instance, so the, the, the checklist uh, asked uh, whether the person with disabilities uh, are represented, including within the staff, among the community mobilizers, among the volunteers. Um, and so it helped them to, to reflect uh, on the team composition, on the HR policy, uh, whether a person with disabilities were encouraged to apply for camp management positions whether reasonable accommodation was also provided for persons with disabilities who work on the site management team. Uh, another example that they gave us was also related to the training uh, of staff and the ability to apply learning uh, to deliver inclusive assistance. So they, of course, I mean, they reflected on it and indeed we had some training together with humanity and inclusion a few years ago, but then when was the last time such training was delivered and was the team uh, still able to, to apply the learning. Uh, other feedback also collected was related to budgeting for inclusion. Uh, the going through the checklist helped them to, uh, to reflect whether we had a budget allocated uh, to support the engagement uh, with persons with disabilities, for instance, uh, or also for site improvement uh, to provide also reasonable accommodation uh, and more. So overall, uh, the, the feedback was very positive and encouraging. Uh, they uh, also mentioned that it would be really helpful uh, as a tool to help them develop a disability inclusion strategy at the site level. Uh, so um, there were also comments that were uh, also interesting regarding the format, regarding the format. saying that the checklist saying would, that the checklist uh, would probably, be probably be shorter than this. Sorry, there is some echo. Uh, so whether so it could be shortened a bit and also uh, be reworked a bit more because if you go through it right now, you'll see it looks a bit more as a guidance uh, checklist. So uh, that was like formatting uh, comments. Uh, next slide, please. So um, the next steps uh, we will uh, find. I mean go through uh, more field testing uh, in the coming weeks. If you are interested uh, to, uh, to pilot it uh, where you are working now, please reach out to the working group, reach out to me. Uh, we would uh, happily schedule a call to uh, go through it together. Um, we will collect uh, more uh, comments and feedback until uh, the end of March and then uh, finalize uh, the, the checklist uh, to be associated with the standards. It will also be uh, submitted to a disability specialized organization uh, for their input and feedback. So uh, thank you very much and I'll stop here. Thanks very much, Agnes. Um, and indeed, if anybody is interested in piloting the standards in their own operations, not just doing a disability inclusion audit of programming, but um, using it more formally in the field testing edition, please do uh, contact either the CCM cluster support or write in the chat to me or Tom privately. We're really interested in getting more people involved in the piloting of the document. Um, Mario, if you can take us to the next slide, um, I think maybe what we'll do is we'll just go off camera at this, or on camera at this point, and 
Um, you see the contacts for Tom and myself up there. In the last few minutes, what I wanted to do is um, just give the other working groups a chance to um, talk informally about how they're going to use the standards within their working groups. So don't disconnect yet, but the um, working group chairs, Annika, Brian, Jorn, Giovanna, friends, this is a discussion among friends. You have each been involved in your various roles as working groups, um, reflecting on the standards, using them, aligning them, making sure that we were um, considering the topics because the CCM can sometimes um, get a bit diffused through its different management modalities and typologies. So Annika, I'm going to ask you first, um, what was your role in developing the standards and how do you find them as working from an area-based approach standpoint? Yeah, thank you, Jen. And um, yeah, I remember many conversations we had and uh, long discussions, especially about terminology, which refers to out of camp uh, displacement contacts and, and also um, with Giovanna, you and me uh, and the working group to discuss how they relied with the uh, area based position paper, which was written at the end last year, roughly at the same time. And um, um, I know there's always, um, because it is a camp management standards and out of camp displacement settings that do have contextually lots of different um, influence and, and um, settings, but um, especially within the guidance notes of each of the standards, there is uh, always a specific paragraph or aspects about out of camp situations. And I think they're really useful um, and also, especially also the, the urban section, which is in the standards, which uh, replies, uh, you know, refers to urban context and the systems of urban environments and networks, um, where maybe the stakeholder groups are much more complex, um, uh, difficult to coordinate with and who you partner with and how you partner with. So I think there's a lot to build on and, and these are really interesting aspects. And um, of course, the contextualization and perhaps maybe even more so in these out of camp situations is, is really, really vital. And um, it would be very nice to hear also from the group here now, people who are here at the moment, what are the aspects, the uh, area based working group with the standards working group, um, as well as the other working groups as we are working quite closely together should be developed now more in detail that this field tested version is there and and I'm sure also um, the programs in the field will use it for out of camp situations. And what can we learn from that? You know, I think this is a great opportunity. So any thoughts, please put them in the chat. We definitely pick them up or just uh, contact us directly. And so uh, I leave it at that, Jen, for the minute. And uh, I hope we can continue that conversation. Yeah, thanks, Monica. Um, it's it's interesting because uh, you did really make sure that the definition of out of camps and area based approaches was was really aligned, and we had many back and forths about that. So I I guess I just I guess that's a reflection of what was happening at the beginning of my mentee, which is <laughs> highly consulted. Um, Jorn and and Brian, you guys have launched a new working group since. Um, last year, and I still call it the ARC. I guess it's called um, Connectivity, Clean Energy, and Sustainability. And there was a question here earlier about um, if there is a lot on um, the environment within the standards. That was a question that was posed to Yorn, I, excuse me, to Tom. And um, then I see another one kind of coming up. And how is your working group going to engage in the minimum standards? Brian or Jorn? Okay, um, yeah, Brian, do you want me to start? Um, of course, I have grown up uh, and uh, I am working in the shadow of strong Scandinavian woman, women, so I try to take as much learning as possible and, uh, and uh, one of the learnings is that uh, they are not 
100% satisfied. And that is an extremely valuable uh, uh, valuable state if you are doing camp management because you are there to look for the gaps. And um, we are looking for the gaps uh, with regards to the standards on sustainability and environment in uh, in our working group and uh, and of course we have just started this working group so uh, this is work in progress but uh, obviously we are looking into new opportunities uh, that's brought to us by new technologies uh, and also improved understanding of uh, environmental issues and we will really go in depth to investigate what impact this may have on uh, camp programming. Do you want to add to no, that? No, I, I think that's great. I, I think your reference to strong Scandinavian women, of course, refers to um, Miss Greta. So that's um, that's lovely and uh, chapeau to you for making it relevant back to that. And you know, maybe you can take inspiration from disability inclusion and, and give us an annex to audit programming or Indeed. something like that. Um, it's, a, it's a new working group, so there's mm. a lot that I know you guys are trying to tackle. Um, Giovanna Mario, we haven't heard for, about participation, and I just want to give you maybe in the last minute, because we still have a couple of people who are sticking with us despite the fact that we're over time, um, any reflections you have about participation and the way it's treated in the minimum standards? Hi, Jen. Um, you're, you're mentioning that we haven't heard about participation, but that's that's not true because the process <laughs> that you applied to draft the standards was so participatory in nature. Um, so um, it's definitely there. One thing that I wanted to mention is something that you also brought up in the beginning of the presentation. It's the indicators um, for anyone who has ever tried to measure anything related to participation. It's just so difficult. And I'm sure so many of you have gone through it. And the fact that you have process, progress, and target indicators measuring both qualitative and quantitative concepts, it's extremely valuable. And m and &E has been such um, an important focus in the webinars and in the working sessions of the participation working group. And I think for us, this is really something to take on um, and disseminate uh, to our members and to discuss further. I think apart from that, um, another step for us is also to look at the minimum standards and talk amongst ourselves in the working group about methodologies, tools that can be used um, to further facilitate implementing them and um, looking how we can best achieve those. That's just something I wanted to mention from the participation working group. That's great. And I'm glad that you mentioned the, the references and the tools because those are something that are included in the, um, the final parts of the minimum standards handbook. And we did make reference to the new tool that was developed by NRC on um, coordination and participation for women. So yeah, there are a lot of examples there. And so um, you've heard four concrete examples from this webinar that is starting us on our walk up the mountain. Um, examples around proposal development and emergency deployment from Tom. Examples around information management and some caution from Elisa around how to make sure that you're really getting the right indicators to do what you need them to do and some of the steps that you would need to take from um, consulting with your side to making sure that you're getting the right indicator to align with what you're trying to achieve with partners and the spirit of cluster coordination. You heard some ideas from Carrie about strategic planning and capacity building. And then lastly from Anyaz about auditing disability inclusion. Um, really the standards are all of ours. They're not just belonging to the working group of the minimum standards, they belong to all of us within the CCCM sector. They also belong to our partners. And Hamza, to reinforce your point, they, they ultimately belong to the displaced people of whom we have the privilege of serving. So now that we've had um, the first CCCM Tuesday, I really thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we are stronger and better together as friends and colleagues. And I look forward to walking up this mountain together with you. And thank you for joining. 
you're welcome to stay online and chat a bit more informally. Mm. I think we can 